What's up, everybody? Big Herc 916, fresh out. You know how we do it over here. And I'm here with AJ, uh, former law enforcement man, and we're chopping it up, bringing you guys some game. And one of the things that's on the minds of a lot of um, people in America is the crime and the surge in a lot of these cities with um, just lawlessness. And it seems like it's it was just almost by design when you look at uh you know the lockdowns the the riots um you know wearing the mask and then the no bail to fund the police and it's to a point now where you know people think like you could just snap your fingers and it's going to go away but it doesn't just happen like that so you know aj from a perspective of somebody who's been in law enforcement and people you talk to how do you view this 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 dramatic change and just, you know, crime in America, man. I think it has a lot to do with politicians being pushed further and further left because of a, an agenda that fits their narrative. And what's happening is they're putting weak leaders, weak police leaders into, into positions of power that are basically belittling and bringing their people down so low and burdening them with so much BS that they're not able to do their jobs. And it, I do believe that it is by design. And I do, I do believe whether there's an, you know, an ulterior motive at the top or whatever that I'm not a hundred percent, you know, I, I can't say with certainty, but what's, what's happening is, is you're getting officers in, in, in every city that don't want to do the jobs because of all of the burden that they have just to simply make a contact with the citizen. They, the power and the number one tool that law enforcement have is discretion. They have discretion when they make contact with somebody is, are they going to write them a ticket? Are they going to make, you know, make them go to jail? Whatever the case may be. Obviously there's certain things that they have to do within the law, but they have discretion and all of that discretion is being taken away. All of that discretion is like, no, people can do what they want. Just leave them alone when it's just causing the crime rate to soar and soar and soar. And it's weak leaders that are not standing up to the politicians, but it's weak leaders that have been put in power by the politicians to do thy bidding. And the one thing I've, I've, I've really learned recently is that there's a huge difference. And I, I obviously, I should have known this being law enforcement before, but it's really hit home now is, you know, you have your city cops, you have your state troopers, and you have your county sheriffs. And your county sheriffs are really where it's at because they are elected of, for, and by the people. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that represent the people, that uh, the communities that they have, uh, in the communities that they represent. And whereas like city police officers, city police officers are put in by city managers, by put in by city boards. And then state troopers, uh, the, whoever's the head of a state union or a state trooper, um, they get put in by the governor. So the, that's going to fall in line politically with whoever's at the top. And if we look at the differences in what's going on as far as the left and the right, there's much more tolerance for crime on the left than there is the right. And I understand accepting people for people, but I don't ac understand accepting crime. Because again, at the end of at the end of that, they're trying to institute their narrative. They're trying to institute uh, their policies, and whether it's the bail reform, and I don't know why. I don't know why they're doing this. Are they doing it so that they, you know, at the end of the day, we can, you know, the Democrats can come in and say, "Look at what crime has gotten so out of control," and then they could lock everything down, and they mm -hmm. can say, "Oh, mm -hmm. we're the saviors." Yeah, exactly. Look yeah, at what we've yeah. done. You know, actually, uh, look at what uh, Gavin Newsom has done in California. Everything's gotten so far out of control. And suddenly now he's putting in 120 state troopers into, I think it's Oakland. Yeah, it's Oakland. Okay, so he's yeah. putting, so wait a minute. You've been in charge of the state police for years now. Everybody can see on the news what's happening. But suddenly now, what are we, a few months away from an election? Now you're going to put all these law enforcement resources into an area to help prevent crime, to help bring the crime stats down. Where, where have you been for the last two, three, four years? So what do you see the solution being? Because... The prosecutor in a lot of these cases aren't prosecuting, <clears throat> and they, they these are you know they said uh quote unquote Soros funded prosecutors, right. and then you know um it, it's they've conditioned now say young people who would normally maybe be going to school or trades or you know doing something constructive to participate in these mob like robberies, yep. whether it's hitting a Macy's. Bloomingdale's, uh, Gucci store. Um, I mean, you know, you, you look at broad daylight and I, I believe it was in, um, uh, uh, San Jose mall. 
These guys had a sledgehammer in the mall hitting the countertops of a jewelry store and they were able to, I think damn near get away. I don't know where mall security was or the cops came, but I mean, the brazenness of yep. what we see, this is unprecedented. I've never seen anything like this where even during, you know, the, 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 the high, the glory days of say New York when there was crime and before Rudy Giuliani came in, it wasn't like people doing just blatant right. robberies. We can't, I mean, everybody has cameras now, so it doesn't even matter. People are getting filmed and they're still doing it. I mean, how do you, how do you curtail that? How do you reverse that? Because it's now those are gateway crimes that just have led to bigger things. And it's like, you know, as soon as you, you know, the, the you know, so law, so the law enforcement steps in, people are like, well, you know, that guy didn't have to do that. But w at what point do you say enough is enough? And then people, like you said, they're like, um, well, you know, we, we, we think crime, you know, was harsh, you know, they didn't have no bail, but there's no accountability. And, and when you have somebody that literally can go in and rob a jewelry store and, and get arrested, if he does get arrested and get out the next day, he's like, well, man, shit, right. You know, I'm out. I've done crime, man. Every time I've done a crime, I got locked up. <laughs> I didn't get out. I, juvenile hall, I was stay. I was gone for eight months. CYA, I was gone for two years, eight months. Fed. <laughs> Every time I got caught, I was done. You know, so it makes you sit down and think. But when you know, oh man, I just got caught with a gun with some silencers. Oh, uh, you're 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 being released. Shit, I'm gonna go right back to what I was doing. So I think oh, a couple of things. One is is that so if you stop arresting or you stop charging, then that's not a crime stat that gets reported to the FBI that shows how not safe your city is. Therefore, it can false, it can boost the city oh, falsely. Yeah, I can tell you that yeah, right now. Yeah, this yeah. is probably going to piss some people off, but why not? I know for a fact that the uh, university police departments here in the state of Arizona have done that. There are unreported rapes. There are unreported drug crimes. Wow. There are unreported sexual assaults because the... There, there have. I should say this. This is in the past. This is. I have known that th this to be true. Current, right now, I can't say if that's okay. Happening. But this is absolutely in the past, and it's true. Where, if you report that rape, well, then that school is going to appear unsafe. If you report that drug crime, then it's going to look like they have a drug problem. So it's falsely bringing down the safe. You know how safe a city is mm. when it comes to the crime in California. Uh, they're not charging anybody for less than a thousand dollars. Not charge it. So that means you can go and steal $999 worth of stuff, and therefore you're not even going to be arrested. So that's why all of these stores and everything are, are closing up in California. Here in Arizona, there's different, there's different um, levels of the crime. So you steal this much, it's this misdemeanor. You steal more, it goes up to felony and all that. And in places where you have laws such as that, it, that are actually upheld by the law enforcement, you're going to, you're, you're going to have a better outcome. But I will speak about this. I know for a fact that right now what's happening, particularly in the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, is they're not charging crimes. Law enforcement are making arrests, and then the Maricopa County Attorney's Office is not charging crimes. Wow. So now, I'm former law enforcement, and I've been out for a few years, and my mentality has changed. I do not believe in hammering everybody. I do believe, you know, let's take a small petty crime. Let's take a gateway crime, a, a, you know, a, a small theft or something like that. Um, I don't think that person necessarily needs to be hammered. I don't. I do think there should be some rehabilitation. And also, I think what's leading to it is just a lack of morals and a lack of values, a lack of family. Um, you know, two parents in a household. There's single mothers and single fathers that are doing a fantastic job. I'm not saying that. But when we lose the nuclear family and we lose the roles of teaching and nature and nurture and all that stuff, you're going to have kids that are just wild. You're going to have kids out there on the street that have absolutely no, no idea where to go, what to do, and it's just going to turn into lawlessness. And so, but on the law enforcement side of the house, you have prosecutors that are not charging because sometimes what happens is, okay, new attorney gets hired straight from law school, goes and works for a prosecutor's office. That prosecutor is going to work at the lowest level. They're going to, like, and again, I, I can speak for Arizona and mm -hmm. what's happening here because I understand the process here. They're going to go work for justice of the peace. They're going to handle minor misdemeanors and all that. Some might be good, move into the felony stages and all that. But you got somebody who gets arrested with fentanyl and a gun. Well, what's going to happen is, is they're going to make the gun charge go away and only stick them with the fentanyl, just a drug charge. So now that person doesn't have the gun charge and doesn't have the additional charge for that. So then again, it makes it seem like it's more safe because it's, we don't have that big of a, of a gun, of a gun problem. We have a drug problem, <clears throat> yes, but 
But if the stats so they're, don't they're, show. They're, they're by design not charging them with the gun to make it seem like the city is not as, uh, as violent as per se with the gun charge, which would raise their stats up? That's, that is my perception of it. And I have spoken specifically to law enforcement within the last two months here in the state of Arizona who have told me that that is what's happening. Not uh, in every county, not yeah, everywhere, yeah. but it is happening at the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. Well, it, 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 it makes sense because, you know, for, for commerce, um, you know, one of the biggest things is having people move into your community who are going to bring resources and revenue for taxation. Yep. So if you have a city where everybody's fleeing, like Oakland or San Francisco, and literally you have like deserts now where you have no uh, no grocery stores, no, no resources, you know, and um, basically people are having to drive now an hour to two hours to go find food, you know, because there's nothing local. And, um, you know, I heard, I heard a, a politician, I, I, I can't remember her name, but she was a black woman. And she was saying that the, uh, you know, these companies that, if, um, you know, they got to think about their bottom line and it's racial for them to, you know, leave these places where these people have no, no options. And I'm listening to her and I'm like, this lady's got to be, you know, she's got to be crazy, man. I mean, why aren't you telling the people to stop stealing? Right. Why, you know, right. I'm in line and right. I got a pocket full of money or not a pocket full of money, but I'm paying for what I want to eat. So you're saying that I pay, but these people run through here with a, a grocery uh, uh, cart full of steaks and whatever else. And that, you know, it's just acceptable. We're supposed to, you know, they got insurance anyway. So does that, how does that work? You know what I mean? I mean, the yeah. mentality of, of some of these politicians that are going along with this, that live in gated communities, that have access to all, they're rich, they're balling, they're, they got, you know, uh, Maxine Waters, she don't live in the hood. Nope. She's in a gated community, Hancock Park probably, wherever she's at, but, you know, they're talking about, oh, this and that, and, you know, she was one of the main people promoting looting yep. during the George Floyd stuff, and so now you're telling these young people who shouldn't be in the streets at night because it's dangerous anyways with all the stuff going on to go and loot and steal from these stores. I mean, you're promoting this lawlessness and now you've gotten people with a mind state that says, hey man, it's okay because it's under a thousand dollars. Or if it's a mob of us, not all of us are going to get caught, but you know, it's okay to participate in this type of activity. So like you said, I'm not saying that everybody should be hammered if you steal a pair of shoes, but then why are you still in a pair of shoes? I've done it. I've stole a pair of shoes, but then it, it led to me trying more aggressive crimes. You know, steal a pair of shoes. Oh, shit. Okay. I get some drugs. Maybe I can sell this, make some money. Oh, okay. Well, shit. Now I'm having problems on the street, so I go get a gun. Right. You know, it just elevates. Right. And people don't realize that it, it just gradually, and then when, when little Bobby or Timmy gets caught up with a gun, drug, and maybe there was a bad situation, somebody try to rob him. He shoots somebody. Now you're like, he wasn't a bad kid. No, he wasn't, but you allowed him yep. to continue, which now has him in a situation where he's looking at a plea agreement for 10, 15 years. Right, right. And, and people don't think about that, you know, and, and it, yeah, going back to the family structure, uh, a, a father and, and a mother in the house. That's, that's one of the main things, having that, you know, that, the, that's, that value system, which has been disintegrated. Absolutely. You know, and, uh, you know, no matter what people feel about religion, I feel it keeps a family, whether you're, you're Muslim, whether you're Christian, you know, whether you're, you're, you're Protestant, it gives you a value system where, you know, I'm not going to hurt this person. I'm not going to rob from the store. I'm going I'm to I'm do whatever I do in a, in a fashion where my family feels like I'm a representative in the highest capacity. You know, you, you feel bad. Like, oh, my grandma knows I go to church with her on Sundays. It's not right to steal. But you know, if I don't do any of that and everything's just, you know, whatever then it doesn't matter because nobody at home cares because we really have no structure in, in foundation. So once you lose that foundation, everything else goes out the window. That, that's exactly it. And it also, you know, k kids are robbing, not kids, but people are robbing, stealing this or that. We've, I, I'm all for capitalism. I want good companies to employ people and make money and, you know, have, invest in their communities and all that. We've placed so much value, though, on the stuff and the things, and the clothes, and the cars, and the jewelry that mean nothing. The older I get, as long as it fits and is comfortable, that's all I care about. But the younger generation, that's all they care about. It's the, the superficial stuff. It's, there's no values in family. There's no values in learning a skill. There's, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. no values in learning how to grow your own food. There's yeah. no values in 
giving back to your community. There's no value in any of that because it doesn't make them look cool. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't make them, you know, give them street cred. It doesn't give, it doesn't give them any of that. We put so much emphasis on the stuff. And again, I'm for capitalism. I'm not, I'm not anti-capitalism in any way, shape or form. I think some things need to be curbed a little bit, but again, we're not putting any value in uh, finding a community, finding a religion, finding people to, to grow with and to help with and be a community. Yeah. That's gone. The community is the streets. The community is, you know, the, the gang banging and all that stuff out on the street for the youngsters. And that, where does that lead you? Well, and, and two, I know people are going to be like, oh, you know, religion, they use that to this and that. Look, man, I'm not saying you can go and say any religion is, is, is bad or good, whatever. I'm not trying to get into all that right. in this video because people go, I'm just saying it, it, it universally, if somebody comes from a staunch, uh, uh, and I'm not saying there's not, uh, you know, things in the closet of some of these religions. I'm not trying to get into all that. All I'm saying is a value system to not violate other people. Amen. Because like you said, I'm all about capitalism too, but nobody made you go buy the Gucci. Right. Nobody made you go get the Louis. Nobody said you had to drive this car. That's your choice. And if you can't, that's free will. If you can't exercise enough free will to say, well, I had to steal it, then you don't need to be on the street. That means you're not can mentally safe. You're a threat to everybody else. That's like saying if you go by and you see something and you want to do something to a little or to an older person, you need to be locked up yep. because you can't control your free will. God gave us free will. Nobody makes you do anything. I don't care how much they market it, how much they show some guy, you know, with a I got I got wings, you drink red, you don't need to steal Red Bull. You don't need you don't need that stuff. So if you can't control that, you can't say they made you do any anything. You know what I mean? So you have to be able to exercise that and have restraint. That's about life, restraint. If you are so aggressive where you have no restraint and you just go out and violate women or violate other people, you need to be locked up. That's what jail's for, people who have no restraint. People who, when you talk to them, they can't balance rational, so they got a cage for you. And that's what it's meant for, you assholes who have no restraint. Yep. As if I have a business in the community, I'm trying to provide resources and, and sell whether it's fruit, whether it's clothing, whether it's automotive parts, whether it's uh, plumbing materials. If you rob me, I have the right to beat your ass. <laughs> I, I, I have the right to I beat just, your I ass, agree. man. You know what I mean? You come here and you want to steal a rack of clothing. I worked hard for that. I don't care if I have insurance. I'm going to choke you out. Yep. That's my right because you're violating that and you have no respect. Just work hard, create a value system, buy it like everybody else. That's all I'm saying. Try that shit in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Oh, yeah, no. Try That's it, and try it in Dubai. Try it in, in some of these other places where they have a value system and that you, there's a consequence to it. And people say, oh, America, go. Well, if it's so bad, go over there and try that right. same shit and find out what happens, man. I'm a constitutional absolutist. I believe in freedom. I love freedom. I love your freedom. I love my freedom. I love everybody else's freedom. But, you know, my right, your feelings, that person's feelings don't trump my rights. My feelings don't trump your rights. And, you know, when you start overlapping the two because it's based on feelings, that's when society goes, it goes downhill because a person's feelings are now more important than a person's right. That's right. That's well, right. We all have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And those things, happiness is not stealing. Happiness is not buying that Louis bag or whatever the case may be. It's creating. It's building. It's free thought. It's growing a community. Do, do you know what happens when you're still in prison? They kill you, man. Person, I've seen a person over, uh, own somebody for weed, literally do getting shanked. No. $20. You still, if you're a jailhouse thief in prison, <laughs> you guys think it's fly, man. I'm telling you, try, I don't care how hungry, if you don't have no noodles, no honey buns, and you, you steal from your cellie's locker, and he finds out you're getting stabbed, man. You can lose your life. No. And so people think, it, oh, there's no, you get in one of these places, and you realize how serious shit is. They, they think it's a joke. Right. Because you see guys with cell phones in jail now, and you're doing this and that, but you steal from somebody in prison, and you think because you needed it because you were hungry, it, it, could be, it could mean your life. One of the things is that, like on the law enforcement side of the house, people have lost the ability to talk to each other. If you have an indifference with your, with your neighbor, what do you do? You call the police. And the police go and go and have to deal with other people's problems. So I'm, I'm pro law enforcement and I'm not against, you know, having them settle disputes sometimes, but people have lost the bit. Now, jailhouse rules, I don't know. That's not my world. You know what I mean? I never lived that, but I understand there's a different level of respect, but just 
on a day-to-day -day basis, people don't know how to talk to each other anymore. They're, st they're staring at their phones all day long. They got to send a text message. They've lost yeah, interpersonal yeah. communications. Yeah, communications and, and respect for other people's yep. stuff. You know, you walk by, it's just like the whole thing, you know, when people got to the point, remember they're selling Amazon packages. And I tell people all the time, you know, here, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm in a nice neighborhood. Shit's going to be here when I get home. Right. In LA, it's not going to happen. Literally in LA, man, if you had a package in front of your house and if it's there for probably more than five, six hours, it's gone. Yep. You know, because people ride around looking for that. And so that's what I mean about values. And because just because you don't get caught or because, you, you know, you're not getting prosecuted for it doesn't mean it's OK. And that's all I'm saying. And I was a criminal, man. But, you know, I'm looking at it now and I'm telling you from somebody who can speak from firsthand and, and, and trying to help some of you guys out there realize that you're on a path that's going to lead to something that you're not going to really, you, you know, be happy with or you won't be able to walk away from. And it, it's, it's, you know, no different than, you know, some of these people saying, oh, um, you know, my kid wasn't a bad kid, but he was out, you know, three in the morning trying to break in cars and he got shot. Why the guy, oh, it's a gun. No, the guy's protecting his property. You have no business being out there at three o'clock in the morning right. trying to break in your car. Right. You hear somebody break in your house, you're paranoid. You go out there and get a gun. And the, the, you know, this person's, you, you're breaking in my shit, man. Yep. What am I supposed to tell you? Stop, leave. Hey, buddy. Wait, I mean, what the, you know what I mean? Really? Hey, buddy, get away from my car. It's three in the morning. My family's scared. I don't know if you're going to go from my car to the house. Who knows? You know what I mean? So the, the the mindset of people saying it's not that bad or, oh, man, you know, they're just trying to uh, they were only just trying to break in your car or, oh, the guy, he just tried your doorknob to see if it was open. I mean, dude, the mindset is it's, it blows me away of people who are going along with that shit, man. There are time and time again, I see the news of politicians that are making excuses for people that are stealing. OK, if you are dirt poor and you have no food, and you have a baby at home, and you steal a pack of, uh, of diapers, and you steal some food, that's a hell of a lot different than stealing shoes, than going and you know, cutting catalytic converters out, than breaking into people's homes. That's a hell of a lot different thing. And there's people that are making excuses for the mobs that are happening, for the, for the going in and ransacking the iPhone stores and the Apple stores and all that type of stuff. It, it's, Your shoes are 100 some dollars. You got an iPhone. Right, your outfit all together is worth maybe with the iPhone and shoes three thousand dollars. What do you? You don't you, now the same now. You, Mine are worth like fifty bucks. But but I'm saying that some of the kids that are stealing the stuff. But so for all that ingenuity for you to plan out the most vulnerable locations that have the least amount of security. I'm just telling you from a criminal. You're looking at you could put that same planning into if you just went and got a grant, went to UTI for six or for eight months, twelve months program. You got a guaranteed job. Yeah, it'd take a little bit longer, but you can buy that shit. You know what I mean? You, you can go to uh, a, a HVAC school, you know, and basically, you know, eventually create your own business and branch off, get you a truck, get a, you know, get a business loan and you can have your own. Now, you're not going to have immediate gratification. But the thing is, that's a false reality, because as soon as you get through after you stole everything, you sold it, you got to go still again. So, OK, so this is a question I have for you. Like we grew up differently. How do you reach the youth to understand the delayed gratification? How do we teach 16, 17, 18 year old kids that what you just said, like, look, man, I know you want that now, but you're going to feel so much better and fulfilled when you work your ass off for it. You have to go and really sit down like, OK, having I, I call it some people call it OG or a mentor, but say you visit somebody. And you see them in it somewhere that's, you know, a nice, a nice house. You know, he's got a nice car, nice things. And you're like, wow, how'd you get this? And he tells his story, you know. And when you hear these stories from people and you hear about the success, like I met a guy, he was, um, I want to say in his 60s, um, black, black man. And uh, he owned several dentist practices and he ended up selling them for like 13 or 14 million, became a millionaire. But he, he had a story where, he said that he was kind of like wasn't wasn't um really you know any any direction kind of was you know going to school but wasn't going to school was selling weed and he said one time somebody sold some 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 guy robbed him for some weed and he said he almost went and retaliated to the guy and it could have led to him catching a case but he said he went and he he didn't do it but he went and visited his sister at college seeing what college was like and then ended up enrolling in college 
and eventually went, you know, got his doctorate and became a, 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 a dentist and opened up a practice, opened up another one. But you look at him now, got a Rolls Royce. He's, you know, got multiple cars, b beautiful house, travels. But you have to, I feel, be exposed to know that there are people like that that exist. Like most people have never seen a black dentist. Most people have never seen a, a black lawyer or a, a, a black doctor or a, a, a black business owner who's maybe a coder in, a, in, in the computer, the tech world, or somebody who's an executive at like, say, uh, you know, Oracle or something like right. that. When you see those people, you know that they're real, but you hear their stories, it puts it in perspective. But if you see everybody around you and they're hustlers, they're, 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 they're street guys, they're gangsters, and all that is right in front of you. That's your that's your tangibility. You can touch that, so it's real to you. But until you can see other aspects of people in life, and even exposure to, to other cultures, where you met maybe this guy over here, he's um he's Asian or this guy's Indian, and you you can have a conversation, it expands your 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 thought process, your ability to see that there's greater opportunities in your surrounding environment. And I think that's the biggest problem, especially in these lower income communities where it's almost set up where you're, you're housed in a, in, a, in, a, in a bubble and you don't leave that bubble so you don't get the experience outside exposure. And I, I tell people that's the greatest thing is put yourself in, in the most uncomfortable positions so that you can challenge yourself to learn things you wouldn't normally interact with. You know, whether it's somebody who's uh, maybe, you know, they're Hispanic they're, they're, they're Caucasian, they're whatever the case may be, and realize that the world is not all one color. It's not all one mentality. It's not all one demographic. You know, there's all kinds of walks of life, but you have to put yourself out there. That's the only way. And even I was exposed to a lot of that, but I was so still frustrated and not knowing what direction because I never really had a mentor. And that kind of led to me doing things that wouldn't normally be within my character as a person. And so I had to, you know, bring myself back to be like, okay, that's not who I am. And I wasn't raised like that. But for a lot of people, I think, um, you know, implementing maybe more mentoring programs, because mm -hmm. you can't help everybody. Some kids, right, right. some people, they're just going to do, you know, oh, you're, you're talking that bullshit. You know, you're a sellout. I don't want to hear it. And, you know, oh, I'm not going to ever, you know. <laughs> sellout to what? Yeah, you, you know, that's the, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's only in that beyond. That's only in the black culture. So I've never heard in the white culture. I've never heard in any other culture, Indian culture, sellout. Korean culture, no. You are you're want to be successful. Yeah, And, and being absolutely. successful means not hanging around you idiots that's what it, that's what it is, yep. you know? So that's the only thing I see, you know, that's the greatest change is, is having exposure. Cause when you see that and you're like, wow, man, there are people that are not stealing, running around thugs, this and that. And you, you, you see, you see that that's not the norm then. Cause the whole thing is once you get to prison and if you start really reading and educating yourself and start, you know, like I said, reading about the constitution, bill of mm -hmm. rights, reading about, you know, real estate or just certain business aspects, LLCs, you're going to be like, man, I got duped because your lack of knowledge mm -hmm. kept you from taking advantage of so many more opportunities. There's so many other opportunities that you could have been doing besides running up in stores and robbing. How many, how many dealers, hustlers, everything that you, that you'd mentioned before, how many of them were actually really intelligent businessmen? Oh, super smart. I man. bet you a ton oh, of them man, were. Super smart, man. And if they would just take that the, from doing the illicit stuff and doing their own LLC, their own business, their own company, they would be multimillionaires within no, no time period at all. Well, the thing, too, is like I, I always tell guys, I said, look, man, not everybody is the goon or the shooter. So I say, if you got a smart friend, you don't chastise them and say, oh, man, you're a nerd, you're a square. Put him through college. Yeah. You're a good a street guy. Okay if you're very good at that, do what you do best, but finance this guy yep. or her, have them get a degree to help you out to get out of the streets and create, now you guys can create a business together because not everybody can do everything. That guy's smart, but he's not able to create wealth like you are in this environment. So you guys work together and that's how you help each other. It's building a community. You build a community. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? So eventually you got your own grocery store, yep. you got your own uh, 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 gas station, you know, you guys are working together, but you took it from, because look, man, I'm going to be honest, Cecil Rhodes, 
um, uh, uh, John Hopkins, all those guys were drug dealers. They, John, Cecil Rhodes was one of the biggest heroin dealers in, in, from England. And John Hopkins, if you do the research, those guys flooded China with, with, with heroin, which during the whole uh, um, the, the, the Opium Wars, okay. and that's how they took Hong Kong. So Hong Kong, they had a 100-year lease, but right. people don't realize how they got Hong Kong. There was a war going on for spices, mm -hmm. resources, minerals. Yeah, so what people don't realize is that, um, you know, a lot of, and, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to act like, you know, uh, you guys should be in the streets, but I'm going to tell you, like, what these, a lot of these people who have these prestigious names um, with these universities or even, you know, a lot of these uh, liquor companies now, they start off bootlegging. Everybody, they, were in, they were in the stuff that made them wealthy, and now that's why they're in the positions they're in. So I'm saying if you are in the streets, um, have an exit. And figure out a, a greater plan because otherwise you'll get caught up and you'll be in a situation where, like I said, you can't walk away from or, you know, you'll be dead, man. And and there's this, this, this these, these people by design are tricking you into a behavior that will have you caught up in the system. And believe me, they're not giving you no bail to help you. The no bail thing is to perpetuate you on a greater course that's going to lead to a, a bigger train wreck. I'm telling you right now, it, it, and I'm, I'm like I used to say when I got, man, I wish I could just get out tomorrow. But to some degree, me getting caught for the bank robbery and sitting down and really looking around at what I, what I did to get there, it wasn't the bank robbery. It was the choices that I made leading up to the bank robbery that got me there, the mindset. And when I started talking to all these other criminals and realizing like, wow, man, what, what was I thinking? Um, I'm trying to give you that before you get to prison because once you're in there, you can't get out. One of the things you'd mentioned, expose yourself to other cultures. Like, this is dangerous. Oh, yeah. This right here is yeah. dangerous to people's eyes. Yeah. And I don't understand that. I, I, I don't understand not wanting to expose yourself to other communities and to be part of the bigger picture. Well, because it, it, it pokes holes in the lies. Mm -hmm. So... If you look at like the people who promote whether it's okay, um, this guy is racist because he has a beard and a big truck, or this guy is is uh, racist because he has a, a hoodie on and he's sagging, and they don't want e either one of us to talk. But when you look at it, we have a commonality. At the end of the day, you want to have a, a safe environment for your your family to to uh, grow in. You, you want your kids to be educated with the highest knowledge possible. You want your, 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 your wife to be able to go to the store and not have to worry about anything. You know, it's family values. And when you talk about like networking and developing business connects, when you start doing business at a, at a, at a international or a global level, you're not dealing with just all one race. Right. You know, if right. I'm selling something on eBay, I'm not saying I'm gonna only want black people to right. buy it. You're not selling, you only want white people to buy it. So, quote unquote, the left, they don't want us talking and then they want us to be at each other, but then they act like they're helping you, but it's not really helping you. And it's no different than what they did before when they try to say, oh, we're going to give you this and give you that. Well, to create dependency is also handicapping you because now you feel like you're entitled and you don't want to work. You don't want to go out there and take advantage of the opportunities because we've created a situation where if you get a handout, it's better than having to go out there and having to apply yourself. You know, they're saying like, you know, when we're kind of going in another direction, but they're even saying now that math is racist. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't get it. I, I, I don't understand where, where a comment like that could be made. I, I'm 100% for social services. I'm 100% for helping people when they're down, when they need help financially, whether it's a disability or social security, um, you know, or food stamps, WIC, whatever the case may be. But let's not create dependency on it. Yeah, yeah, let's I agree. Create, let's create, um, I think it has a lot to do with a uh, person's self-esteem as well. If they don't feel as though they're worth anything, they're not going to go out and try to achieve anything. I think there's a lot of well, entitlement well, well, as well. well the, the programs, you know, um, with it, with it um, I, f I forgot the president, with the Johnson, when they said that whole war against poverty, see, that was mm -hmm. incentivizing single households. Because, see, a lot of people don't realize, like, when they pass that, in order to get a lot of those benefits, the father couldn't be in the house. Okay. So, you know, when you study the history, 
And even Malcolm X said, it, you know, that was the that was the destruction of the core foundation. And then it became like, you know, hey, they were going around. And, hey, well, if you don't have, you know, if the father's not here, we'll give you this amount of money, this check. But he cannot be in the house. So now the father only came in for a couple hours a day mm. and he was out. And, and, and initially they pushed that. There was a the whole study. They pushed it around a lot of the communities in New York which had a strong black community. And then eventually it gradually went into the white communities. And then now you, you go and you look at the, the numbers. If you go back to like uh, prior, like say the 1940s and 50s, you had 80, over 80% of fathers and mothers in the house yep. together in the black household. Now it's like, it's like I, I don't even know if it's even 50%, but the numbers have drastically declined and a lot of that is incentivized through, you know, promiscuity, you know, uh, single baby moms getting, you know, welfare. You know, you get these, you know, oh, uh, my daughter's about to turn 18. Let me have another one. Get another check from this dude. You know, they promote all that stuff. But a lot of people don't sit back to see the, what's going on, because if you're getting a check every month and you got this guy, that guy or whatever situation, there's no there's no motivation for you to get out here and actually apply yourself in the workplace to create a trade or a job that's going to be promising. And now your kids watching you, yep. they're going to grow up and do the same thing. Yep. Daughter, 15, having a kid, you know, son, you know, he went out, he got two, he got a baby mama before he even graduates because he's watching his dad. My dad's not here. So what do I care? Right. You know what I mean? It's baby. I'm not married. So there's no value in even having that bond with you're saying being married or relationship because it doesn't matter. I, I, my mom and dad was never together. My dad, I barely know him. He's, in and out of jail, or he pops by here. My mom said he owes us for child support. She's always blaming everything on him. Right. You know, I right. can't get clothes or shoes because of him. So I'm in the streets. I'm going to go steal and rob. I'm going to do whatever. Shit. It, he ain't shit. So now you have hatred toward your dad, which leads to hatred towards other people that look like you, which means it's easy for you to assert that hate towards other uh, uh, individuals and have that aggression. So it's just a build up, it's a psychological build up in every direction. And you look at, you're just destroying each other. You're just eating each other from the inside out. I, I agree 100%. And I'll, one thing I want to say also is that like, when you take a look at historically what's happened in the United States, I absolutely positively do agree that the United States government has done horrific and terrible things to the black community. From the Tus Tuskegee experiment to uh, redlining and banks and, and not allowing, which has not black allowed- Black Wall Street, they did the first bombing, they bombed the all black community. Yeah. First it, terrorist act. The the um, criminalizing um, cannabis, uh, introducing crack cocaine, you know, and having a difference in charging for a white a white boy with cocaine is totally fine. For powder. And everybody's partying yeah. on the weekends in Miami and California and all that to where someone living in the, in the, in the hood in Bronx that has crack well, they're going to get twice the amount. These are all terrible and horrific things that have that have happened, and nobody can can deny. Like to deny it is to just stick your head in the sand. But at the same time, I don't understand from within the uh, the community itself <clears throat> what has caused the destruction within the communities, inner city, and not just the black community, but the Hispanic community, every other community. What has caused this destruction, and why can't they rise up out of it? You know what they 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 can. And we, we, we can't, but they have to want to, and they have to, the people who have the voice that, <clears throat> excuse me, that is bigger than mine, <clears throat> they have to want to speak out, but they're not doing it. Like the, the, the guys who maybe have rapped about selling drugs, who've never really sold drugs or whatever the case may be if they did, but now that they're successful, they have to come together with other successful entertainers, athletes, okay. these guys and say, you know what, we're going to start this program. We're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to like. Uh, 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 you know, speak out against the, the the drill rap, which is nothing but killing each other, or, or against the, the robberies, and say, "Hey, man, let's let's bring trades back into the community schools. Let's let's fund these programs." They can do that, but nobody says anything. Nobody's going to buy their music. You, you're going to be cut off. Yep. You know, it, it, so an athlete politicized, he can say things that's going to benefit a certain political party but when it talks about the community he can't say anything about that like you said you'll be blackballed from your record label but if we need you to push something up, you got to do that because you owe us so it can be changed you know there's you, you have a you know you see all the stuff going on and you see people saying stuff and they're like well you guys are you, you guys it's racial but where are the black people who also see the same thing 
who also wouldn't want their kid doing that, right. why aren't they saying something about it? They got a bigger platform, but they're too busy promoting uh, whatever narrative or you know satanic stuff, whatever they want to promote. That's cool because that fits what they're doing. So until we have some accountability, because I'll tell you right now, I don't see, I, I, have, I have Vietnamese friends, I have Armenian friends, I know I have Russian friends, I have Persian friends. I don't see none of their people entertaining that type of bullshit. Right. I don't see, I, I, know, I, have, I know people that are Jewish. I don't see them entertaining that bullshit. Um, I know people that are Indian friends. I don't see them entertaining that. So we're the only ones who, and then we sit there and complain. But we're not trying to fix the problem. And that's the only way we can fix the problem. We got to have some accountability, man. I, and I do think that. <clears throat> I think the, the government does need to have a hand in this. But the problem is that the, anytime, you know, the government gets involved in anything, they fuck everything up. Yeah. And as opposed to somehow converting it into a way that's beneficial for the community, beneficial for the people at the lowest level, instead of just making politicians rich. Look what's happening in L.A. and L.A. County and all that. They've spent billions of dollars on the homeless population. The head of their of their organization that deals with the homeless population and all that makes hundreds of thousands of dollars <clears throat> as a government bureaucrat. But that's a three it's over three billion dollar industry. So you're talking about fake jobs. So if we fix the homeless problem, there's no money. There's no money. See what I'm saying? So yes. we need to perpetuate it because that's how we keep getting into funding. Yes. So it's it's a it's a system that feeds off itself. It's disgusting. Because if you fix the problem, all those people who aren't really doing anything but passing out syringes and crack pipes. They now have to find something else to do, and they are getting, like you said, six-figure paychecks for fueling the problem rather than trying to fix it. And I've interviewed homeless people on my channel and, and talked firsthand, and you know some of the stuff I heard, they're like, man, the one guy said he had to pretend to be on drugs in order to get into the program. And he was in a wheelchair. He said, so if I didn't play the game, I couldn't get the, 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 the benefits of the program. And he's like, I'm not even on drugs. He's like, I'm trying to actually do the right thing. But I have to act like I'm a certain way in order for me to have housing to get on my feet. I, there, there are so many good people that are doing good things that just want to help humanity. But then you hear of instances like this where it's just a scam. And it's like, again, it's just perpetuating that, that person who has a $350,000 a year guaranteed government job, yeah, yeah. you know, just so that they can help the homeless as opposed to helping the homeless. Yeah. Yeah, it's disgusting. It's disgusting. Hey, man. Big Herc 916, AJ, fresh out.